He bled and died for me. He loved me. Because of love just for me. He said this captain free. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I shall never know just why he loved me. Because he loved me. He went to Calvary. Bled and died for me. He loved me because of your love for me. He set the scalp to free. Yes, he did. And I shall never know just why he loved me. Yes, because of love, of love, just for me, he went on. He said, this captive free, oh, I shall never know just why he Love, love me. Loved me. Good morning, Boynton Chapel, for this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We celebrate today the resurrection of our risen Savior. And we're so excited to have you worship with us today. So wherever you are in your homes, we ask that you put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. In this strange season that we are in, as we continue to not be able to meet in person in lots of ways, and obviously here at the church, we have moved our worship to online services until further notice. It is our goal to keep our church family and community safe. So I want to just take the minute and talk to our church members, our attendees, and our faithful givers of the church to continue your financial giving. The church is still going on. We just had an awesome food pantry last week in which we serve record numbers. I just want to give you three ways in which you can continue to give. Online, through Zelle, at BoyntonChapel at gmail.com, and online through Givelify at Boynton Chapel United Methodist Church. And if that digital stuff is not for you, you can mail your check to Boynton Chapel United Methodist Church, 
2812 Milby Street, Houston, Texas, 77004. We love you, and we sure do hope to see you soon. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Eternal and everlasting Father, Father God, in the matchless and wonderful and powerful name of Jesus the Christ, Lord God, we come before you this day giving you all honor, glory, and praise. For we thank you, Lord God, for being our Alpha and being our Omega. We thank you, Lord God, for being yet alive and our risen Savior. So God, we ask that you just move by your spirit and have your way in this place. Touch us, God, from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet. And God, we'll be so careful to give you all of the honor and all of the glory and all of the praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you would allow me for a little while, I want to share with you what God has shared with me as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. I ask if you would turn with me to your Bibles, to the Gospel of Luke, found in chapter 24, verse 13. I'll give you some time to get that. That is the Gospel of Luke, Found in chapter 24, verses 13, is where I will begin reading. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleophas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things, he asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action, and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all of this, it's the third day since these things happened. Let's go down to verse number 28. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with him that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. Then their eyes were opened, church, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. This is the word of God for the people of God. There are many stories or encounters in the Bible that I really, really love. For example, Moses turned aside from his flock of sheep to see why a bush would burn and not be consumed. Jacob laid his head on the stone while he was running away from his troubles and saw a stairway to heaven. And then years later, he wrestled all night with the manifestation of God in the flesh. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting high on a throne and lifted up in the temple. But still, the passage of scripture on the road to Emmaus is one of my favorites. It brings the story of the earthly life of Jesus to a close in a way that is really a launching pad for a sequel that is still unfolding. Whatever it was that happened, on that road, the first Easter evening is still taking place. 
We join this moving passage of scripture with these two disciples walking down the Emmaus Road. A walk from Jerusalem to the city of Emmaus was a walk of about seven miles. And as they walked, they recalled the activities of the previous week. These two disciples had either been present or else heard the news from some other source about the death of Jesus. Their hope that Jesus was the promised Messiah had been devastated, dashed against the rocks of death. Disappointment had replaced hope. What could be more final than a grave sealed with a massive stone? Jesus was dead. These followers of Christ must have wondered how God could let this happen. Those who loved Jesus moved about as if there was in some awful dream. They mourned because they loved Jesus so much and believed they could never know him again. It was evident that they regarded the ministry of Jesus as ended. But church, as these two disciples walked and talked, trying to reason in their minds what had happened, the text says that Jesus came in their very midst, and they did not know who he was. Church, I think that it is very interesting that these disciples, these followers of the way, were walking down the Emmaus Road, and suddenly Christ appears in the midst of them, and they do not know who he is. After all, church, these disciples had personally witnessed the ministry of the master. They had heard the Sermon on the Mount and had been taught to pray by the master himself. After all, these disciples had seen Jesus the Christ walk up to a man who had been laying by a pool some 38 long years and told him to take up your bed and walk. These disciples, church, were there and were eyewitnesses to the fact that there was a woman with an issue of blood who reached out and touched the hem of his garment and was made whole. You see, church, they witnessed all of that. They were even there when he called Lazarus by name and told Lazarus to come forth. These disciples had seen Jesus the Christ at work. They had seen the marvelous miracles of Jesus, but not only, church, had they seen the marvelous miracles of Jesus, they were there, church, when Jesus struggled with the cross and needed assistance from Simon of Cyrene. They were there when they marched him up the hill called Golgotha to Calvary. They were there, church, when they crowned his head with thorns. They were even there when they saw him being sentenced with the latches that literally tore his skin and ripped his skin from his body. Church, they were even there when they nailed him to the old rugged cross and placed him between two thieves. You see, church, on that Friday when the earth started rocking from side to side, that noonday sun refused to shine. The veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, hung his head between the locks of his shoulders and gave up the ghost. When he said, Father, it is finished. Church, they pierced him in his side and the blood came running down. They crucified our Savior. They tore, took his body down from the cross and wrapped it in some linen. They laid him in the borrowed man's tomb and they were there, church, when he died. But church, I find it very strange. In my mind, I raised two questions. How can you fail, church, to recognize someone that you know so well? What is it that causes us to be so close to Christ, but yet not know who he is? These disciples did not know who he was. Just like many of us, how can we be so close to Christ Sunday after Sunday and still, help me Holy Ghost, not know who he is? So close to the cross, but so far from Christ. What causes us, church, not to recognize someone that we know so well? You know, we may forget a person's name, 
but we typically fail to recognize a person's face. You've heard the expression, I never forget a face. Just as these disciples had recognized Jesus, we too should recognize Jesus and we should recognize him by his countenance. If we're not able to recognize him by his countenance, let me tell you how we're able to do that. Jesus always looks like church, who he is. You remember the story over in Daniel when King Nebuchadnezzar had put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over in the fiery furnace, and when he went down to check on the progress, he said, didn't I put three in the furnace, but now I see four, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Jesus' church always looks like who he is. They should have known him or recognized him by his countenance, but not if not by his countenance, church, they should have known who he was by his very conversation. You read the Bible, don't you? Never a man spake like this man. He spoke and the winds lay down at his feet. He spoke and Lazarus came from eternity back into time. He spoke and a woman's sins were forgiven. He spoke and turned a funeral into a festival. They should have known who he was by his conversation. If not by his conversation, if not by his countenance, they should have known who he was by his very context. In verse 27 of the text, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Church, well, the very fact that he was able to open up the scriptures and share with them the power and the might in the scriptures should have caused them to know who he was. I can imagine that these two disciples did not know who he was because they did not recognize the Messiah who would be widely rejected, who would be disfigured by suffering, who would voluntarily accept the pain, suffering, and death that sinners deserve, who would make an atonement for sin through the blood, who would take upon himself the grief of human sin and sorrow? Who would die on behalf of the iniquity of us all? Buried in a rich man's tomb. Jesus. They didn't know who he was. But he's the one that would bring salvation to the one who would believe in him. They didn't know who he was. But he was the one who would be exalted and adored and be very high. But Jesus was in their very midst, and they did not know who he was. Church, how do we fail to recognize someone we know so well? How do we fail to recognize them? And we're singing his song, praying his prayers, offering up our services, but yet have never, help me, Holy Ghost, been touched by the master himself never have been touched by the blood of the Lamb. What is it, church? How is it we can be this close to Christ and still not know who he is? They should have been able to recognize him by his countenance, by his conversation, by his very content. But as they walked, Jesus raises the question. He says, what you sad about? Listen to how Caiaphas responds. Are you just now getting here? How can you ask him who is from everlasting to everlasting if he's just now getting here? How do you ask him who is the alpha and the omega if he is just now getting here? How do you ask him who is the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star? if he's just now getting here. What's going on? Jesus raises the question. What things? They begin their marvelous narrative to tell him what's going on, what had happened in the last week. They are trying to bring Jesus Christ up to date. How can you bring Jesus Christ up to date? The one who knows all things, 
the one who is here from the very beginning. How do you bring Jesus the Christ up to date? They tell him that Jesus was crucified. Y'all know about some religious folk, some Bible toting folk, some scripture quoting folk. They killed him and our hearts were, are broken. They have killed the son of God and it's been three days. Church, he said he was coming back, but he hasn't coming back and it has now been three days. You see, we haven't heard from him. That's what the disciples said. We see no sign of his coming. Nothing appears as we expected. Jesus, all is silent. We are often like these disciples, waiting for God to fulfill a promise. You may be wondering what is taking him so long. He said he will always be there. He said that he came that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. It's been three days and he still has not shown up. He said that he will always be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Where are you, Jesus? I've been living single and holy. And he promised that he would send me a God-fearing husband or wife who would love me as Christ loved the church. And yet it has not come to pass. Where is he? I've been laying on my sick bed diagnosed with cancer, sugar diabetes, lupus, high blood pressure, depression. And he said that he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, church, we are healed. It's been three days, God, where is he? He said that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and that he would supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. It's been three days, God. Where are you? God, I have buried my sister, my brother, my mother, my father, my friend, my husband, and my children. And you said that you would protect them and you would keep them, God. For you did not give me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It's been three days, God. Where are you? God, where are you? What's taking you so long to answer my prayer? I'm your child. I tithe. I give. I worship. I serve. But when my back is up against the wall, God, it seems like heaven does not move. It's been three days. God, where are you? God told me to tell you this morning, church, that his silence is not a sign of his inactivity. Help me, Holy Ghost. Let me tell you that again. God told me to tell you that his silence is not a sign of his inactivity. When he is silent, church, he is behind the scene working it out for your good. He is working in the not yet. So when your problem moves from the not yet into the right now, he can make it no more. Because all things we know work together for the good of them who love the Lord and them who are called according to his purpose. But church, I'm almost done here. But as these disciples approach Emmaus, they ask Jesus to come in and tabernacle with them. Something in their hearts and mind compelled them to have this traveler, this stranger stay with them. He had something that they wanted desperately. And as he came into the house, some strange things, church, began to happen. Somebody brought the bread and put it on the table. And Jesus took the bread. He blessed the bread. He broke the bread and he gave the bread. Church, I said, Jesus took the bread. He blessed the bread. He broke the bread and he gave the bread. The scripture says, then their eyes, <laughs> me Holy Ghost, were, was, were open and they knew him. Then their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Well, pastor, what's your point? I'm glad you asked. My point is, therein is the cycle of life. I said, therein is the cycle of life. All of us come to a point in our lives where Jesus takes us, he blesses us, he breaks us, and then he gives us. I know, church, that there is somebody who has been taken, snatched from death by the mercy and grace of God, 
and wrapped in the loving arms of Jesus. Somebody who has been blessed. Every time you turn around, you've been blessed. You've been blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in your coming, and blessed in your going. Then, church, there's somebody who has been broken, broken by the wind and rain, broken by bereavement, divorce, or serious illness. But, church, I just want to let you know that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I'm here to tell you that whatever or wherever you are in this cycle of life, God has his hands on you. If he takes you, he has his hands on you. If he blesses you, he has his hands on you. If he breaks you, he has his hands on you. If he gives you church, he has his hands on you. Is there anybody who knows that God has been good to you? Is there anybody in here who can shout that because of God's grace and because of God's mercy, you are here today? You've had some powers and that stood against you. You had some rules that said that it should not be you. You had some stereotypes that tried to deny you from receiving your blessings. You had some isms that tried to work against you. You even had some structures that tried to hold you down. You had some systems that told you, oh no, you can't do that. But church, we serve a God who is able to remove anything that the enemy tries to put in our way. Church, we serve a God who knows how to break the rules to bless your life. We serve a God who knows how to put you in places that people say that you shouldn't be. We serve a God who knows how to give you what folks say you should not have. Is there anybody in the house who's excited that we serve a risen Savior on today? Is there anybody who is excited that he still lives in the name of the Father and the Son? And the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time of worship. God, we ask that you could continue to guide your people. Your people. God, someone under the sound of my voice, God, is facing some challenges right now and don't know what to do. God, I ask that you just take them in your arms. Cuddle them, God, and let them know that they could depend on you. That, God, you said that you would perfect everything that concerns us. And because of that perfection, we will look to the hills from which cometh our help. God, help them to know that there's no greater love than the love of Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for us, but got up early that Sunday morning with our power. Church, we would like to thank you, all of you that are worshiping with us online. We would like to thank you for visiting us and coming along with us as we journey through this new normal. We know and we're excited and we can't wait to get back into the church house to see you. So God, we just, we just thank God for you and we hope that you would like us on our Facebook page, which is Boynton Chapel UMC-Houston, or subscribe to our YouTube page, which is Boyd to Chapel United Methodist Church. Again, thank you for coming and have a blessed day. For me, just for me. Jesus came and did it just for me. Jesus came and did it just for me. Just for me. me. Just for me. me.